while. Yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while since we have both sat down and talked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> yes, yes. And today's topic is imposter syndrome. So, um, you know, when you mentioned that, I was like, hmm, I was literally like scratching my head and wondering, OK, <laughs> what is this all about? <laughs> and I am um, really looking forward to this chat and learning mm -hmm. more about it. So let's begin with what is imposter syndrome? Sure. So um, a lot of you may have heard the term and some of you may be wondering what it is. And for those of you that are hearing it for the first time, it is not a psychological condition. It's not a disease because sometimes when you hear the word syndrome, you kind of associate it with some kind of a condition or a disease. It's actually um, a feeling. It is actually, um, you know, the actual definition of imposter syndrome is doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud. It's this constant feeling where you feel like, oh my God, people are going to find out or people are going to realize I'm not as great as I think I am or as other people think I am. So it's a very, very interesting concept. Um, it was first, um, you know, imposter phenomenon was first discovered or talked about uh, way back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And then it got, um, you know, started kind of moved, the terminology shifted to imposter syndrome and got started being talked about, especially in the management circles in the 1980s. The concept or the study started with focusing on women. Um, and even now, actually, it is to a great extent associated with women. It's this feeling of not being good enough or not being great enough. And ironically, um, most people that experience imposter syndrome are very highly accomplished. And oh, they really? are actually... Um, you know, doing really well. And w so it, it's almost kind of ironical that someone that is very highly accomplished, uh, almost is an expert in their field, but constantly feel this insecurity or feel that they're going to be discovered and people are going to find out that they're, they're not really the expert that they think they're, they are. So it's funny because driving in this morning, I'm thinking about talking about imposter syndrome and I'm like, I hope Lynn doesn't ask me things that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> I feel like such an imposter talking about imposter syndrome. So, you know, it is, um, and there's a lot of research. One of the preeminent researchers, Valerie Young, um, she did her thesis on imposter syndrome. And she's a world-renowned speaker. She's talked and done sessions in uh, various areas. And she started off, actually, uh, as a PhD student when she was 21 years old. Mm. And, um, you know, she uh, she was in this academic cohort where there were a lot of other women that uh, were getting their PhDs, were getting their advanced degrees, and they started talking about and sharing their insecurities and formed an imposter group so that they could support each other through the process. And um, Dr. Young shares her personal story that, that the university that she was getting her PhD from, her mother used to work as a night shift janitor in that same university. So, you know, you kind of get that social context where um, she knew that she had broken barriers and really gone beyond what her family or, you know, what anyone would have thought she could do. She was in this well-renowned, world-renowned program getting her PhD in psychology and uh, you know, at the same university where her mom had worked there for years and years. So um, that's kind of, that gives you a little bit of a pretext of mm -hmm. where imposter syndrome comes from and why high performing and you know, highly successful individuals um, experience that. And the research shows that about 80% of us at some point of time in our lives are gonna experience that. Yeah. So true. <laughs> I'm just thinking about, you know, like my time, right? Like uh -huh. when people would say, oh, wow, you know, like 
um, when I got my promotion at work mm -hmm. and everything, mm -hmm. but I was still so like, you know, do I, I don't deserve this or mm -hmm. things like, mm -hmm. why is mm -hmm. this, you know, why me? Mm -hmm. You know, what have I achieved? And mm -hmm. all these questions and uncertainties, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I was just like thinking about, about all my, you know, my uh, journey mm -hmm. in my career path. And it was always, it was always like, I'm not good enough. And yes. uh, I really, really don't deserve this. And mm -hmm. why is this happening to me? Uh -huh. And I would just keep beating myself constantly. Uh -huh. And wow, that was, you know, yeah. it's just like, that's so that's exactly is. what you defined is you didn't realize, but that's exactly what you were experiencing is that imposter syndrome. And it's way more, more common than we know it is. So it's, um, you know, when you talk about it, it, it really is, it could be anyone. And then we look at, uh, we look at freemans personalities yeah. and we look at, you know, um, artists and um, there's actually a couple of very strong, powerful women that you would look on to as a role model. Mm -hmm. Michelle Obama came yeah. out and, um, you know, talked about how she felt like an imposter. And when you think about it, again, you know, being uh, a first generation African American woman that went to Harvard, went, got an extensive degree, was the first, you know, first um, African American first lady of the country. You can imagine that you would think that someone like that would feel very secure yes. and very proud. But that's one of the fascinating things about imposter syndrome is the more you experience uh, accomplishments, the more successful and accomplished you are the more you feel this because you constantly then you are always setting yourself up for those higher expectations and you always feel like I'm going to let people down because people yeah. are counting on me they're expecting that same level of accomplishment from me all the time and so I'm going to let people down and that nagging fear kind of stays with you you have Tina Fey who talked about, you know, um, having imposter syndrome, Charlize Theron, Bala Davis, Mary Angelo. These are all, you know, women role models yeah. that you look at, celebrities, they look so confident, so assertive, but they all have had experience yeah. with imposter syndrome. So, but you know, even though we talk about it mainly with women, um, it, a large proportion of men also realize that they have it too. It's just a difference in, uh, you know, and some of it when we talk about differences in gender. Um, as women, we mm. tend to hold ourselves, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see we tend to hold ourselves to much higher standards. Mm. And, you know, the self-confidence, um, there's a lot of socialization in how, how we share our achievements and our accomplishments. And there's a lot of pressure as to, you know, you don't want to talk too much about your accomplishments because then you're looked at as arrogant, Yes. right? Uh, versus a man is always expected to talk about his accomplishments yeah. and he is measured, you know, his success is measured in terms of the accomplishments that he has versus in our society women are you know more the nurturers yes. and you know it's almost um, you're taught to be humble or you're expected to be humble and not really sing praises about yourself or your accomplishments so we tend to downplay our accomplishments and then in our minds that kind of takes this form where it's the narrative that you're telling yourself in your head right uh, now it's of course not as simple as that. It's not just a frame of mind. It's just not a thought process. It could be so many other factors. And you know, as we talk a little bit more today, there's mm. different manifestations. You know, environmental, society, and a lot of different manifestations about why people experience imposter syndrome. Yeah, and there are different types too, correct? Mm -hmm. Of uh, imposter syndrome? Yes, so when we look at the types, and this is mainly Dr. Valerie Young's research, so she talked about five types of imposter syndromes, okay? So you have the perfectionist. 
The perfectionist is the person that focuses on how you do something. Mm -hmm. They want to really, really get it right and make sure, you know, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. They want to be a perfectionist in everything. Now, perfectionism is not a bad thing, okay? But when you take it to the other extreme, then it can end up, you hold yourself to such a high standard that 99% is not good enough. Even if you fail one time, you beat yourself that one time because you want to succeed or be perfect in anything and everything that you do. And obviously, as a human, that's we know that that's not always the possibility. So, a perfectionist in you know in the type of imposter syndrome where the perfectionist they want to do their they want to have their A game every single time. So even if they've got their A game ninety nine out of a hundred times, they will not focus on those ninety nine times. You're going to beat yourself up for that one, one time. <laughs> where it didn't end up being the way you wanted it to be perfect, right? Yeah. So, so that's... Sorry, but is that mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about? Uh, is it only... Is it for the workplace environment or in our daily lives? Oh, no. It, it could be anything. It could be anything. Okay. It could be, you know, my kids think I'm the perfect mom, right? Yeah. And so if I miss one recital or if one meal that I cook they don't like, or you know, their friends don't like me, I feel like a failure. I feel like an imposter because I wanna be that perfect mom. I wanna mm. be that role model. So it could manifest itself in any way. And okay. so, you know, what we're talking about today, you can, it, it would, you know, it, it impacts relationships in, mm. your, in, a, in your personal life. It impacts how you perform at work. Uh, you know, employee morale and the ability to keep high performers at work engaged and, you know, uh, help them continue, it leads to burnout. Because if you're constantly beating yourself about things, then, you know, you're going to feel burn, burnt out. So it could manifest itself in your personal life, in your professional life, anywhere, in anything that you do. Okay. Yeah, I know because in in old movies and all that, you know, mm -hmm. like in the Bollywood movies, for instance, mm -hmm. the wife is always doing the perfect things. Like she's doing yep. the cooking, the cleaning, <laughs> and it's always portrayed that way, right? Yeah. And I know things have changed now, but yeah. then I, I think that plays, uh, like it plays on our minds, right? Absolutely. Because then we want to be that kind of a person. Absolutely. Absolutely. We want to have our house looking perfect. We want uh -huh. to have our kids brought up perfect. And, all and you're looking things. perfect too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're when you're, you're in bed. shape. You've got the best makeup your on. Your hair looks perfect. You wake up looking gorgeous every morning, <laughs> and then I wake up and look at myself and I'm like, "What did I do wrong?" <laughs> <laughs> like when we were younger, we say, "Wow!" You know, when we watch movies and uh -huh. we look at these uh, actresses and. Like, Wow, we didn't even realize, right? Yeah. And we're like, wow, her hair is so good. Even when she wakes up in the morning, Asma's <laughs> laughing. Asma's thinking the same thing, too. And it's like, where? And, but now, of course, we are just like, oh, yeah, it's just a movie or whatever, yeah, this right? Is, this but, is but it me. Plays this in is me. Yeah, like, oh, I wish course. I could look like that. Mm -hmm. I know many times we would say mm -hmm. that I wish I could look like her. I wish I could, mm -hmm. you know, wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> And that's where that environmental and social pressure comes in. Yeah. Absolutely. Then you have the expert. Okay, so the second type of uh, imposter syndrome is the expert, where the expert feels like they know everything about a certain topic. And that's what, you know, the people's expectation is that you know everything, right? So here I am talking about imposter syndrome, so I need to be the expert on the topic, right? So... Uh, <laughs> The, you know, the perfectionism. So this is the knowledge version of the perfectionism. Okay. In the perfectionist focuses on the what, like, you know, uh, sorry, the how, how do you do something? Mm. The expert focuses on the how, you know, the knowledge piece of it. Okay. So, you know, it's about how much do you know and, you know, can you do something? And so the expectation for the expert is that, because you expect to know everything, even a minor lack of knowledge is going to make you feel like a failure, is mm. going to make you feel like a fraud because you're expected to know this, Correct. you know? So if you ask me a question about, 
imposter syndrome and I can't answer that, I'm going to feel like, oh, my God, now she's going to realize that I'm a fraud and I'm just talking about something that I don't really <laughs> know. I'm not really the expert. So mm -hmm. that's how it manifests itself. Then the third uh, kind is the natural genius. And the natural genius is someone that cares about the how and the when, but the competence is measured in terms of how quickly you do it and how easy it is for you. And I'll give you an example. So, you know, and as I was reading this, I could relate to it because you're thinking about, you know, where, how, how else do you use this? I'm thinking about my daughter. She's seven. She does not know how to ride a bicycle. Um, and, you know, I kept thinking, the first time she got on the bike and she fell down, after that she's refused to get on. Like, it really takes us so much of coaxing to even get her to try again. And I kept thinking, what am I doing wrong? Where am I going wrong, right, in motivating her to do it? Now, she is naturally gifted. She is way more mature than her age and smart. And obviously, most parents think that about their kids. <laughs> but I truly know this one no, is. she is. I've met her. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I was reading about this, I realized, and it was a breakthrough moment, because when you understand these things, right, and mm -hmm. then that, for me as a parent, it was an aha moment, because I realized that, for her, her expectation, because everything else, reading came easy to her, math came easy to her, you know, social skills, she is an extrovert, she's out there talking to people. So things come naturally to her. Hmm. Biking is not coming naturally to her, okay? And so she just assumed she's going to sit on the bike and pedal <laughs> into the sunset, and when she fell, that fear that, oh my God, I mean, this is hard and I don't know how to do it, right. you know? And that fear itself manifested herself in, in such a way that now she doesn't want to even try because she's scared of the failure. And so, you know, for me as a parent, now I have to figure out, now that I know that she's suffering from natural, you know, the natural genius imposter mm -hmm. syndrome, because for her, it's like my my parents think I'm perfect. Not that we say that, but you know, my parents, you know, and for her, in her, in her own eyes, she's like, I do everything else so mm -hmm. comfortably. I'm so quick at picking up things, but I've tried and I've fallen and I've tried again and it's not coming naturally to me. So I'm just not good enough for this. I'm not gonna try it, mm -hmm. right? And so now you have someone who is afraid of trying something and don't want, doesn't want to do it because it just didn't come fast. And so for people like that, you have to be able to motivate them to say, it's okay. It's okay not to be good at certain things. And, you know, put in the effort and you'll get to it, mm. right? And I, this morning, you know, I, I, I follow Adam Grant, who is a psychologist at uh, Wharton, Hmm. And interestingly, this morning on his LinkedIn post, he uh, shared uh, a post and he talks about imposter syndrome. The definition is or a person with imposter syndrome, that thought process is, I don't know what I'm doing. It's only a matter of time until everyone finds out. OK, that's how an imposter syndrome, someone with imposter syndrome thinks. If you reframe that and you talk to someone with a growth mindset, what they would say is, I don't know what I'm doing yet. It's only a matter of time until I figure it out. Hmm. And you see that difference? And so, you know, with imposters, it's about, oh, everyone's gonna find out. But you've got to reframe that and say, you know, it's okay. It's just a matter of time hmm. before I figure it out. And sometimes you may you know the the first time I you know the first time I landed my first hospital CEO role I was yeah. 35 years old um, you know someone of Indian American or uh, you know of Indian origin yes. 35 year old woman yes. you know CEO of a hospital I can't tell you how terrified I was going into work the very single first day thinking oh my god I have no idea how I got here but I'm not gonna make it <laughs> too far <laughs> before people realize that <laughs> she's not cut out for the role. <laughs> you know, that fear and that anxiety drove me to work like 12, 18 hour days, oh, wow. literally, because I was so afraid of being found out. 
And I didn't realize that at that point, it just drives you to work more and more and more because you're, you're, you know, and again, it was because I didn't have role models, right? Mm. Anytime you're breaking the barrier or you're doing something where you don't have a lot of representation, where it's almost like I was representing every other Indian American woman who yeah. was 35 years old and that burden was on my shoulders, right? That yeah. I broke the ceiling, I'm out there. Right. On top of that, I'm an immigrant, okay? So you add the layers of <laughs> pressure on it given. Um, so those are kind of the things that end up, you know, causing that and so it's not just one thing it's just it's different of, yeah. um layers of uh, yeah layers yeah. of it so let's go on a, a quick break and when we come back we will continue our conversation with Mitali paul this is chai time on 99.5 fm Welcome back to Chai Time on 99.5 FM. We are in conversation with Mitali Paul. The topic of the day is imposter syndrome, and we were talking about the different types mm -hmm. of uh, imposter syndrome. So let's continue with that. Sure. So we talked about the perfectionist. Okay. And then we talked about the expert, and we talked about the natural genius. Uh, the other two types are the soloist and the superhuman. So the soloist is really focused on getting it done by themselves. You know, they don't like asking for help. They're fiercely independent. They just want to do it all by themselves, right? She's like, I'm sorry. And so, no, I mean, it's, it's amazing because you're able to relate to a lot of these things and you don't even realize you're experiencing it until you start talking about it or you hear, or hear about it, right? So that's, that's a soloist. It's for them. It's, I can do this, you know, I'm able to do this. And obviously you've done it in the past and you know that you're capable of it. But then at the same time, if you need help, you don't want to ask for help because then you feel like people are expecting me to get this done by myself. And if I can't get it done by myself, if I have to ask for help, then I'm an imposter and you know, I'm not living up to people's expectations. So that's the soloist. So anytime they're not able to do something on their own, then they feel like they failed in whatever they did. And then the last type, which I think all of us can relate to is the superhuman, right? <laughs> so the superhuman measures competency based on how many roles they're able to juggle and how many different hats that they can wear. Right. So if you fall short on anything, just like I said, I have to be that perfect mom. I have to be the perfect healthcare administrator. I teach. So I have to be the best possible professor or adjunct faculty that my students can ask for. And I want to be that perfect in every single role. I don't give myself any leeway for mm -hmm. failing or being less than perfect in any of these roles because I believe I'm superhuman, right? And so if I'm less than perfect in any of these roles, then I, I start again feeling, I feel anxious and I feel like I'm going to, you know, I'm a fraud, I'm an imposter, people don't, you know, are going to feel like, oh my God, she's not able to do what she's doing. So it's basically falling short in any role Mm -hmm. Could be a parent, could be a partner, could be on the home front, could be professionally, as a friend, as a volunteer. Anyway, um, it evokes shame because you feel you should be able to handle it all mm -hmm. perfectly and easily because, you know, you know what needs to be done. But it's just, again, f that superhuman feeling. So mm -hmm. these are kind of, you know, the the five main types of imposter syndrome that people feel like. Uh, we talked about the causes. We talked a little bit about what are the different things that cause imposter syndrome. So the, one of the most important things is family, upbringing, childhood, right? And I gave you my daughter's example. Yes. So a lot of times if you get, there's different ways. One could be where you get a lot of praise, you know, as, as you're growing up, you, you just can't do anything wrong. You're that perfect child, your parents, your family, your neighbors, anyone is constantly praising you about every little thing that you do, right? Mm -hmm. And they may feel that they're encouraging you, but it may actually lead you 
to where you believe, again, you're perfect as a grown up, as an adult. And so, or even as a teen, right? Just because in your earlier childhood, you got a lot of praise, you expect that you can't fail and you're going to be perfect and do everything great. And then when you do fail at something or don't really meet your own expectations, you feel like, oh my God, all the time that those people told me that I was this great, now they're going to find out I'm not great anymore, right? Right. The other um, could be if you have very critical upbringing where people are constantly, you know, either your parents or your family are constantly making you feel inadequate mm -hmm. right and that's that's kind of where oh you can never be good enough you're not doing anything right you, it's the parents who are perfectionists and are constantly pushing their kids to do better and even if you know they get a 98 you're like why didn't you get a hundred right yeah. and so when it's that kind of pressure then of course you're constantly feeling you know unimportant or feeling constantly the pressure of saying I'm not good enough I'm not able to you know so even if you are very good mm -hmm. if you're not great at something you're gonna feel that way so family and childhood definitely plays an important role in why people feel imposter syndrome then you have personality you just have different personality types some people feel more insecure are you know a little bit more um, in terms of confidence and self-esteem they're not as confident and so for them um, you know any big break maybe you get a big job promotion or you know you meet this great you know perfect woman or perfect man and suddenly you're feeling insecure about you yourself it could be any big change that happens in their lives and because they are lower on the self-esteem it tends to manifest itself as imposter syndrome okay then there are, there is a small proportion of people that it's truly a psychological mental health issue where you're constantly feeling anxious about everything mm. and so anything that is in the realm of personal or professional accomplishments you're constantly feeling like an imposter. For those people, definitely, you need not just reframing, but therapy and counseling and help. So there are certain individuals where it really is a mental health condition. Okay. But for most people, you know, you're going to feel it because of several other different factors, not mental health related. Um, then we talk about environmental, you know, one of the examples I shared is you get this big promotion yeah. or, you know, you move to a different city and you have to build your own, you know, network or a friend circle and you were very popular and famous wherever you were and people knew you and now suddenly you're in a new environment and you have to prove yourself because you have to really, you know, integrate into the new surroundings. And I was thinking, oh, wow, you know, and I was, I had this great network and everyone thought so highly of me in this environment. And now I've moved into this new place mm -hmm. and no one knows me. And, you know, I have to live up to those same expectations that and get to where I was in my previous environment. So it could be any big environmental changes as well. Okay. And then, you know, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about organizational because you know so far we've talked more from the personal from the familial you know from an individual uh, yes. perspective but professionally more and more as you learn about uh, imposter syndrome you know if you are in a leadership role if you are within an organization the reason that people feel um, the impact of imposter syndrome is because you don't have enough representation mm -hmm. you don't have enough intersectionality of just the example that I shared about myself right um, young immigrant woman who is of Indian origin right mm -hmm. in a successful role as a CEO the biggest factor for me feeling like an imposter was when I looked around at that organization that I was at, which had 115 hospitals. Mm -hmm. I was the only one with my intersectionality in the entire company, right? 
there weren't any other women off Indian origin, leave alone an immigrant, yeah. you know, leave alone 35 years old, yeah. who was a CEO. So when you look around in the organization and you don't see representation or a role model or someone that you can relate to, you definitely feel like an imposter because you're like, I don't need to be here. I don't deserve to be here. Um, you know, they're going to quickly find out yeah. that I don't deserve this role. So that's where, from an organizational perspective, you know, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, and you know, every organization now is trying to work towards yeah. that. And that's why it's important to be able to have that representation across the board, not just women. You know, it could be the LGBTQ plus community, it could be anyone, it could be the immigrant community, it could be, you know, um, whether it's gender or anything or race, you mm -hmm. know. Um, African American women tend to feel more imposter syndrome than white women, you know, when you look look at the research and so that's why um, you know that representation is important then there's you know there's racism there's gender bias yes. there's microaggressions at work all of these things impact that you know if you are and um, women in science feel this way a lot of times uh, women in IT Cheryl Sandberg shared that she felt like an imposter because often she would be in meetings and in the boardroom and she'd be the only woman, uh, you know, because how many women are in tech? You see more and more now. Yes. But, you know, when she was coming up the rungs, you didn't really see that. Um, one of my favorite role models is Indra Nui. Yes. And, uh, you know, when you hear her talk about her journey, right? A lot of times she was the one who would go to meetings and see that all the executive team members the women, even though they belong to the executive team, would sit on the chairs alongside and not at the table. Mm -hmm. And she would have to actually encourage them to come sit at the table. And there was no reason for only the men to be seated at the table because they were all part of the executive team, but the women needed to be invited to come, but the men would walk in and go straight and, go straight. and sit at the boardroom <laughs> table. Right? Yes. And so, I mean, again, That's the so women true. out there yeah. were, you know, they felt like they didn't really belong, even though they had worked just as hard or maybe even harder to get to where they were, but they felt like imposters. They didn't feel mm -hmm. like they belonged at the boardroom table, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't realize how common it is, but it is. And so, you know, you hear people talking about it. So when you think about, uh, you know, one of the examples I wanted to show from that organizational perspective is women make up only 24% of all tech professionals, mm. despite being half of the population, right? And one of the major factors attributed to this is that 56% of women leave their tech jobs mid-career. At the same time, 57% of women in STEM careers report having experienced imposter syndrome with many saying that it was from feeling out of place or feeling like they didn't belong. So it's a vicious cycle because yeah. the more you feel it, right? And then you're going to get burnt out or you're going to quit or you're going to give up. And then that reduces the representation so that even people that are wanting to come in don't feel those role models. And that cycle, that cycle just continues, Yeah, you know? So, so what are some strategies to manage this? So let's talk about some of the organizational ones since we were talking about organization and then we'll come to the personal strategies. Um, for organization, it's not, not about just fixing people, right? Mm -hmm. It's really about finding out what are the factors in the environment that are causing it and are relating to it and to create an environment that really fosters a number of different leadership styles. And, and you know, you're giving importance to diversity of race, ethnicity, gender, um, and you're looking at how can we have more DEI efforts and have more representation of the underrepresented minorities, whatever it may be. Doesn't always have to be gender or race, but right. any underrepresented minority, how do we have more individuals 
within the organization so that others feel like they belong and don't feel like an imposter or don't feel like the pressure that they have to represent <laughs> their kind, right? Um, then increase rewards and recognitions, you know, especially for the high performers, constant uh, recognition, letting them know they're doing a good job so that they don't feel that pressure of, oh, I'm not good enough. You know, I failed once out of 100 times, so I'm not good enough. But have recognition, celebrate those achievements that people make, mm -hmm. especially the hardworking people that you know are really, really pushing themselves. Um, eliminate marginalization of underrepresented uh, individuals. If you see microaggressions, if you see things that are not appropriate that could, you know, be subduing individuals. Those behaviors need to be stopped and people need to be educated and let them know that that's not okay. You know, um, if you have one woman colleague in a team of, you know, 10 male colleagues, you mm -hmm. have to make sure you include the person. You can't just plan golfing outings or, you know, I'm assuming she doesn't go off or you know after work events where she can't make it because she has caregiving responsibilities or kids that she wants to go back home to so mm -hmm. how are some of the things where you can do things differently to be more inclusive so the person does not feel like they don't belong and they feel supported correct you know, in different ways and then you know eliminate stereotypes we we do that all the time we constantly have stereotypes so being able to eliminate that especially in a work environment and these are how organizations and companies can better support mm -hmm. uh, individuals and help them with coping with imposter syndrome because as I mentioned the cost of it, having it within an organization is high because it leads to turnover it leads to burnout it leads to lower productivity lower morale so it's not okay this person feels like an imposter it's their personal problem let them figure it out yeah. as an organization you have to see what's happening in the organizational environment mm -hmm. that we as leaders can impact and change yeah when you mentioned soloist and i <laughs> looked at asma asma was like and i pointed to myself and she's nodding <laughs> But I think, I mean, I know I, I do it. It's just like, I, in my mind, I'm like, you know, I might as well just do it because it takes a lot more effort and time to mm -hmm. share it or to get somebody else to do it and make them understand how to do it. And, you know, I really don't want to get into all of that hassle, right? So that's why I kind of like just put it on myself. But then what happens is I get so overwhelmed. Uh -huh. And then I'm just like, oh my God, why didn't, why am I doing this? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know there's so many negative um things come on your mind right mm -hmm. and i'm just and then you just i'm just pulling myself down i'm getting yeah. frustrated yeah. and then that goes towards my uh you know my work at at the restaurant too that affects yeah. everything and yeah. now then that's what i realized that mm -hmm. hey you know it's okay i can you know get someone ask for help get someone mm -hmm. else to help and it may take a little of time, a little bit of time, but you have to trust that person that mm -hmm. that person will, you know, get also get the job done. So mm -hmm. it's more like that. So I am getting better, Asma. You are. <laughs> you are better. You're getting awesome. <laughs> well, She's like, you, you know, and in your case, you are actually the perfect blend of perfectionism <laughs> and soloism, right? So you are a living example that you can have multiple types <laughs> of imposter syndrome happening simultaneously because you want it done perfectly and you believe only you can do it perfectly <laughs> and you don't want to teach anyone else to get it done, right? So. She teaches. No, I still bother. <laughs> I don't understand this. I don't understand. But you have the patience to teach. <laughs> like I would lose it, but she <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, you know, for me, I've, I've learned a lot along the way, right? Mm -hmm. And and now when when you you were uh, came up with this topic and then I was reading uh, th uh, through some of the things and I was like, mm -hmm. wow, this is what I am mm -hmm. and this is what I am going through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are, you know, we have to work through those ways. And mm -hmm. um, this is not only meant for, uh, you know, this imposter syndrome is not only meant for the corporate world. It mm -hmm. is in general for everybody absolutely so yeah. yeah and i was actually going to ask you can children develop but then you shared that story mm -hmm. about your daughter mm -hmm. so that kind mm -hmm. of answers uh, yeah answers yeah. the question too yeah. 
And I think that that's what, I mean, you know, a lot of times um, it, it could, you know, appear in different individuals and in different uh, times. Maybe you don't experience it and you go through a big life change, right? Mm. It could be you go through a divorce or, you know, you suddenly re-entering the workforce after having stayed at home to take care of your family or what have you. Anything that's major and life changing uh, could also add that additional stress and, you know, and you can experience imposter syndrome because, you know, maybe you took 10 years off, right? Yeah. Um, from work and now, you know, you still have the degree, you still have all of the accomplishments that you had when you were in the workforce. Uh, but just because you took five years off or 10 years off, now you are filled with self-doubt because you're thinking, oh my God, you know, how am I going to cope and what am I going to do? And what if my knowledge and skill set is very out to date, right? Or you go through a divorce and you suddenly realize that, um, you know, you are on your own and you're having to do everything else that you, you know, maybe had a partner to share with. And now yeah. suddenly you have to reinvent yourself. Um, you also have people that maybe, you know, your entire life was focused on raising your family and taking care of, you know, all your responsibilities. And then suddenly you find yourself where your kids are off to college and you know, you're know you like, oh my God, what am I gonna do with myself? People are gonna realize that I have no interests, no hobbies, nothing. And you know, I feel like such a fraud because my entire existence was being a mother or being a caregiver, you know? So it, it could be just anything, any types of scenarios where you could feel this way. So let's talk a little bit about when you do feel that way, mm -hmm. how do you manage it? Right. What are some strategies, right? So the very first thing is you have to acknowledge the feelings. Correct. Realize what you're experiencing is normal, you, you know, and acknowledge it. Be able to talk to someone about it, whether it's your partner, whether it's a friend. Uh, in a professional circle, you could talk to a mentor, you could talk to a boss, mm -hmm. you know, anyone that you look on to or anyone that you feel comfortable talking about it, uh, that helps, you know, to get that support. And then seek out role models, you know, people that you can relate to that have gone through, you know, tough situations or challenges or accomplished things. And then you look at it and you feel comfortable because you see them and you see that representation and yeah. you see that if they were able to do it and, you know, they probably went through it as well. Like for me, knowing that Michelle Obama went through it and, you know, all these other individuals exactly. went through it, you feel right. like, okay, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. If someone, you know, that's successful yeah. and who looks that perfect, right? Can also experience it so it's normal yeah. and it's natural um, and then the other thing is to be able to own celebrate and revisit accomplishments um, something that again men do a very good job of when women don't do if you get a compliment as a woman your first reaction probably is to downplay it yeah right so you know if I say wow I mean you're an entrepreneur you're you know you're you working on a restaurant and you know you, you um, were a successful professional and you've changed and you're doing so many different things your first thing is going to be like oh yeah you know I just fell into place it really happened or I was really lucky that's yeah. probably going to be the first thought in I'm your like, mind no, right? I'm not. what are you talking about <laughs> I'm not even successful right see that's what your first that's thought so is true. <laughs> but that's how most you know, most women are because somehow from that societal thing, you know, if you're seen as arrogant, then you get a B word associated yes. with it, right? If you're too ambitious, you get a B word associated yeah. with it. But if a man is not ambitious, then people start wondering like, why is he not ambitious? Like, why is he so laid back? So there's those societal norms that are associated with it. Yeah. You know, even when people would compliment me or say, wow, you know, like when I got, um, you know, I, I got an early achievement award from my university for my professional accomplishments. And I'm at the award ceremony and my hands are shaking because I'm like, I have no idea why they're giving me this award. Like, you know, it's not a big deal. And even in my speeches, I was talking about it. I was like, I was just in the right place at the right time. And I was rehearsing the speech with someone. And that person said, no, you were not. You worked your butt off. 
to get yeah. where you were. So own those accomplishments and don't always downplay yourself because it's the voice in your head. If you're constantly downplaying your accomplishments, then you're obviously going to feel that anxiety or feel like you don't really deserve it. And that's that's the root cause of imposter syndrome. So learning to acknowledge and, you know, constantly revisit the accomplishments. And when you're feeling that way, to go back and say, look at what all I've done. Look yeah. at how far I've come. Look at everything that I've overcome to get where I'm at. That would not be possible if I were an imposter. Right. If I haven't been discovered in 40 something years, then I'm not getting discovered right now. So Correct. I'm true. I'm, 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 I'm it. I'm legit. Right. So constant reminding. And then there may be and, you know, definitely. And this is something don't compare yourself to other people because yeah. everyone has this perfect life in social media. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then you look at everybody else's perfect pictures and perfect vacation and their homes look great and they look in shape and you're looking at yourself going oh my god you know yeah don't compare yourself because everyone's got their own challenges and then if there are certain areas that your competency is not that a game then find out ways on how you can learn that skill or you know if it's education get that education that you need get that certification that you need mm. so it gives you the validation that yes this, you know, I own this and I am an expert because I have done this because there may be certain things that you're not as good at and you're excellent in other areas. So if that's causing you to feel like an imposter, then focus on that and make sure that your competencies are, you know, great in those areas. Uh, build confidence, set realistic goals. Mm -hmm. Don't constantly be after that perfectionism. Um, and see yourself as a work in progress, yeah. right? So it, it, it doesn't have to be that you're constantly, you, you don't have to be perfect and there's no destination. Life's a journey, right? So personally, professionally, you're constantly working on yourself. So yeah. look at yourself as a work in progress and if you fail at something, it's okay. It's just a stepping stone to getting better at whatever it is, right? And then, Two other things is visualize success, mm. right? How you define success, visualize it, gets you cl closer to it. Don't be scared of failure. And then self-compassion, you know, being nice to yourself, nicer yeah. to yourself. Yeah. We don't think twice about doing something nice for someone else, but we don't really take the time to show ourselves that compassion or that care to say, give yourself a pat on the back and say, Matali, you're doing a good job. You know, look, look at what you've done and what more you can do if you keep at it. Yeah. You know, and taking that time to recognize that. Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. I mean, what a way, great way to end. <laughs> I, actually, before I end, I wanted to share the story. So we had an event at Arlings mm -hmm. and we had couple of council women who was at the event mm -hmm. and they kept thanking us like Irfan mm -hmm. and myself and Arlings for doing such a great job for the mm -hmm. community and we could not like we said thank you but we kept saying it is because of y'all y'all are doing a good job and all mm -hmm. and then uh, one of the council women Carol uh, mm -hmm. she said y'all make us look good you know, this is our job as politicians, yeah. but y'all are actually doing all the hard work. So you y'all yeah. deserve it and y'all yeah. should be proud of what y'all are doing. Uh -huh. On your accomplishments. Yes, I know. So that's what came to mind. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalia. It was such yeah. a wonderful conversation and the time went by way too fast. It, it was always so much does. More, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad I got a chance to sit and, uh, you know, like do yeah. this topic with you. And I'm always grateful that uh, for your time and you, you come here, you know, to chai time and always impart such great knowledge. So thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, chai time. Uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in to chai time. We shall see you same time, same place. Signing off, chai time on 99.5 FM.